Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwaraha, Guru Deva Param Brahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha, Chinmayam Yapyat Sarvam, Railokyam Sacharacharam, Tattadam Darshitam Yena, Tasmai Shri Murave Namaha, Vameva Mata Chapita Vameva, Vameva Bandhu Chasaka Vameva, Vameva Vidya Prapitam Vameva, Vameva Sarvam Namadeva Deva, Vameva Sarvam Namadeva Deva. So let's again learn our Shanti Mantra for this particular Upanishad. And uh, does anyone need a copy of it? I think most of you know it. I'll do one line and then you repeat it after me. Om Bhadram Karne Vishrinuyama Devaha Om Bhadram Karne Vishnu Yama Deva Bhadram Pashe Maksha Virya Jatra Bhadram Pashe Maksha Virya Jatra Stirai Rangai Ishtushtu Vagum Sastanu Bihi Stirai Rangai Ishtushtu Vagum Sastanu Bihi Vyashema Deva Hitam Yadayuhu Vyashema Deva Hitam Yadayuhu Swastina Indro Vridha Shravaha Swastina Indro Vridha Shravaha Swastina Pusha Vishwavedaha Swastina Pusha Vishwavedaha Swastina star show arish the name. Swastina star show arish the name. Swastino brehas patir the datu. Swastino brehas patir the datu. Om shanti, shanti, shanti. Om Shanti 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 So was that Amini who came Monali. in? Monali. Monali! Oh my! How wonderful! Yes, happy to be here. Oh, what a joy. What a joy. <laughs> so we are on our second lesson of Mundaka Upanishad. One of the principal Upanishads cuts right to the heart of the knowledge. And so uh, in the very first discussion we had in the first mantras, we had the notion of the Guru Shishya Parampara. And most of the time, Brahma Vidya is not about learning data, gathering information. It is about a relationship. When we have evolved enough spiritually, we're able to come in contact with a woman or a man of knowledge. And then that wonderful dance begins to happen. And uh, uh, Mark, what mantra are we on for this week? 
Uh, chapter one, number five. Number five. So we had the first questions. What is that knowledge which is ultimate, which is supreme? What is that by which everything is known? And then the Rishi answers, well, there's actually two kinds of knowledge. Up Paravidya, the lower knowledge, and Paramavidya, Parajnana, the supreme knowledge. What's the lower knowledge? That's the knowledge of this world. We find that in the Karmakanda, the ritual portion the action portion of the Vedas. We have instructions on how to live a righteous life, learning some of the basic laws that makes human interaction, human endeavor successful. As Krishna says in Gita, this knowledge gives you mastery of this world and the beyond. But, big but, everything in this world is transient and temporary and is only gained through effort. So, Monali, are you dancing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you dance without practicing? No. <laughs> Anybody else have any field of human endeavor? Can't do it without work. Let me give you a slogan. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Makes no sense. Why? Because if it's really important in this world and it's really hard, you're not going to be very good at it when you start. So many of us are plagued by the klesha, the character defect of perfectionism. If I can't do it perfectly the first time, I'm not going to do it. So we have to be willing to make mistakes. We have to be willing to be a student. And we have to be willing to put in the effort. But the end result is always finite and And then we have the supreme knowledge, the higher knowledge, which is in a different realm. So we're on uh, mantra five or mantra six? I can't remember. Mantra five. Mantra five. Puni, will you help us out, please? Tatra para Riga Vedo, Yajur Veda, Sama Vedo, Atharva Veda, Shiksha, Kalpo Vyakaranam, Niruktam, Chando, Jyotisham, Iti, Athapara, Yaya, Talaksharam, there, the lower knowledge is constituted of the four Vedas, the Rig, the Sama, the Yajur, and the Atharva, and the six Vedangas, Shiksha, Phonetics, Kalpa, Code of Rituals, Vyakarana, Grammar, Nirukta, Etymology, Chandas, Metrics, and Jyotisha, Astrology. Now, the higher knowledge is that which leads to immortality or that which goes beyond the word meaning in languages. So we have in the knowledge portion, excuse me, the, the uh, Karmakanda, the ritual portion of the Vedas and these other texts. It's a catch-all for worldly experience. We can now, in this day and age, include getting a computer science degree at Stanford. You can also include studying engineering at MIT. 
or biological sciences at Cal Berkeley. This day and age, it means all of the various worldly knowledges that we can acquire. I want to say something here, which may be a little bit um, heretical for very religious Hindus. All scriptures of all religions, when it comes to the moral portions, the behaviors, the Dharma Shastras, the Karmakanda, are written in a cultural context and a historical context. Though the inspirations may be divine, they come through human minds. Let me give you an example out of the Christian tradition. St. Paul says, wives obey your husbands, Slaves, obey your masters. Ladies, what do you think of this one? Hmm? It's nonsense. No, it's God's word. It's in the Bible. You think slaves should obey their masters? Or do we think slavery is wrong? We know more today. Not in the Quran, but it's in some of the earliest Muslim teachings that a woman should cover her head. By the way, early Christians did that too. But also, there are things that are put forward in the Shastras. We know better today. So they're a place to start. They're a place to start. But what I would recommend, ultimately, your actions in this world are governed by a well-informed conscience. In your heart, each one of us has a sense of rightness. It's what the Hebrew prophet Isaiah called the still small voice. So, for example, if you betray your personal integrity, something else. Mm, wish I hadn't done that. Who's ever had that feeling? And human minds are such that frequently we will hide a bad motive underneath a good one or a, a rationalization. Well, so-and-so really needed to hear the truth, so I'm going to tell it to them, even though it hurts them. Was I punishing them? Well, it doesn't matter that I stole those tennis shoes. It's the man. It's the system. They're all out to, to screw us anyway. We hide a bad motive underneath a good one or a rationalization. So a yogi learns to pay attention to that well-informed conscience. We have a great intuitive sense of what's right. Hopefully also we've had some moral training. And basically the moral training is the same in all religions. But again, 
the invitation is do not take it literalistically. Any thoughts on this? And in the end, as Polonius says in Hamlet, and this above all, to thine own self be true. In the Karmakanda, that's the way we take the election of the implied meaning of our journey through the moral, the behavioral teachings in the Vedas. Any thoughts on this? All religions have stories of people who then leave that tradition because of narrow-minded preceptors who use the religious teaching as a bludgeon, as a weapon. give you something that will be a good guidance. We think of these scriptures as illuminating God's will for us. Here's the real test. Doing God's will brings us peace. Check it out in your heart. Check it out in your heart. Then we have in the Shastras, in the scriptures, supreme knowledge, the higher knowledge, which we find in the Upanishads. What is that knowledge by which everything is known, without which Nothing can be known beyond which there is nothing to know. Knowing which the searching ceases. Any thoughts? Next verse or next month. Yatta Dadresham Grahyam Gotram Varnam Achakshuhu Shotram Tada Shotram Tada Pani Padam Nityam Vibhum Sarvagatam Susuksham Tadavyayam Yadbhuta Yonim Paripashyanti Dhiraha That which is invisible, ungraspable, unoriginated and attributeless, that which has neither eyes nor ears, nor hands nor legs, that is eternal, full of manifestations, all pervading, subtlest of the subtle, that imper imperishable being is what the wise perceive as the source of all creation. Yes. So our first question at the beginning, what is the source of everything? And now our Rishi cuts right to the heart of it. So nothing we can say can define the infinite. Words fall short, ideas fall short, Images fall short. They can point, but they can never define. So many of the great rishis will indicate ultimate reality in the language of negation. We have the very, very famous saying, neti, neti, na iti, na iti. 
What does that mean? Who can tell us? Not this, not this. Yes. So what's the this we're talking about? By the way, we never say just neti. We never say neti, neti, neti. It's always neti, neti, the two. Because it's a negation of that which is finite on the microcosm, the individual, and the macrocosm, the So what are we negating? On the individual plane, the practice we take up is Drik Drishya Viveka, the discrimination between the self, not self. Remember the Upanishads thunder, I am Atma Brahma. This self is Brahman. Self is ultimate reality. So the discrimination between the seer and the seen, we're going to do neti, the first neti. So let's start with the phenomenal world. Can you see the candle on the table? Yes. Are you a candle? Yes. You're the knower of the candle. Listen to the sound of the traffic. Are you the traffic noise? No. You are the knower of the traffic noise. We can go through the entire phenomenal world that way. Now let's go to the body. Most of us think, I am my body. And my body plus the personality. But when you were a child, you had a small body. You went through adolescence and the body changed. Now you're an adult, body has changed again. Some of us like David and me, body's really changing again. Get in your golden years. But do we not know the changes in the body? Take a deep breath. Do you not know the breath in the body? Or not the body? The knower of the body. Uh, it is. When we go to the realm of energy, prana, sometimes I've gone to the gym or I've been dancing, I'm full of energy. So I don't feel very good. I was out too late, wake up in the morning. But do you not know the present? or absence of energy. Uh, it is not this. Some of us think God is a feeling. Oh, I felt something in meditation. Is that it? Did it have a beginning and an end? Was it subject to change? Did it come and go? And were you not aware of it? Ah, uh, it be. It's not a feeling. In your head, do the problem two plus two. Visualize a strawberry. Think of what you had for dinner last night. That place is called buddhi intellect. It's where thought happens. But the thoughts go by like your hand in front of your face, like the sound of the traffic. You 
are now. Oh, well. It is that by which everything is known. Yet itself can never be known as an object. Yet it's not unknown. How do you know you are you? You do not see, hear, taste, touch, smell, emote, or think yourself. Yet you do not doubt that you are. Now the second not it be. Brahman is the word we use for ultimate reality. Pragnanam Brahma. Brahman is consciousness. So it's not the jagat, the phenomenal world, all the objects, the people, places, things, and situations in the phenomenal world. It's not that. It's not cosmic energy. It's not Hiranya Garba, the total mind. It's not even Ishwara. The Lord, the total Vasana. Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. Oh, this is barely Brahma. Brahma Satyam Jagannitya. Brahma alone is real. The novel world is an illusion. And then the scriptures thunder in the end. That witnessing consciousness that I experience as a hum, I. And Brahman, the ground of being of the whole universe. They are the same thing. I am Atma. So with this in mind, let's parse the various ideas in this mantra that we just did. So let's go through them bit by bit. The first idea. That which is invisible. Yes. So you can't see yourself. If it's knowable, that isn't it. Yet it's not unknown. It's like trying to see your eyes. It's like trying to taste your tongue. It's like trying to find a flashlight, shine a flashlight on its own batteries. That doesn't mean it's not knowable. Who are you? So, if it has a beginning and an end, if it occurs in time and space, if it's subject to change, if it's in the waking dream or deep sleep state, past, present, or future, and most importantly, if it is knowable as an object, that isn't it. Oh, Jim, I think I saw the self in meditation. It was indeed meditation, and there was in front of me gold light. Oh, Jim, Babaji came to me in my meditation. Tell him to get lost. It is invisible. Next idea. Ungraspable. Yes. 
Jim, I think I've got it. Is it like this or is it like that or is it like this? The tendency of the intellect is to want to think of it as an understanding. This is what we call parokshagyanam, indirect knowledge. What's the essence of indirect knowledge? Brahman is. We want aparokshagyanam, direct experience. I am Brahman. It's different. Those of us who are studying Viveka Trudamani. Shankara thunder without near Vikalpa Samadhi. The mind is still apt to confuse the bodies, the conditionings with the self. Without that, what you have is indirect knowledge. It is known when we unknow the mind. It is not graspable by the intellect, but it's not unknown. It's you. Next idea. Unoriginated. Yes. Vedanta thunders the doctrine of a jati. Now, this is problematic for some people. A jati means unborn or unoriginated. The Vedas and even Gita imply the doctrine of reincarnation. What is the doctrine of reincarnation? In Gita, Krishna will say, as a person casts off worn out garments, so this embodied soul casts off uh, physical bodies and takes up new ones. So what happens? The gross body, the stula, sharira, and the subtle body, the sukshma sharira, goes to some loka. If you've done good deeds, it's punya loka. You've kind of been a rascal. You go to Papalok for a time. Then, impelled by our desires, we come back to Manusha Lok, the world of being human. Work on it some more. But that's not yourself. Self is never born. Shankara's greatest example of this it's like the space in the cup. The physical body is like the porcelain cup. Someday it will break and be gone. The subtle bodies like the coffee in the cup. If this cup were to crack, I could pour the coffee into another cup. It's called reincarnation. But you are like the space in the cup. You have to use your imagination here. So we have cup space, we have room space. So if I drink all the coffee and then break the cup, what happens to the space in the cup? Still there. Does anything happen to it? Yes, no? No. no. Okay, and my magic trick. So over here, cup, coffee, cup space. Pay attention to the cup space. <laughs> Did I move space? No. Wait a minute. I have to put it back in the cup? No. 
you go nowhere. Now, the easiest way to understand why this is so difficult to grasp. Here's a good question. Do you incarnate into a dream? Who well, you had a dream last night or recently? What did you dream? Um, I dreamt of my spine, spine in my neck. Were you like in the doctor's office or lying on the ground? What was going on? Um, I was sitting and I was feeling my spine and I could feel, maybe I was sitting down. And did it hurt or did it just do something weird? It was kind of telling me that there's something off there. Okay. Now, do you incarnate into the dream? I don't think so. That's correct. So in the ninth chapter of Gita, Lord Krishna says, I am not in them. God's not inside you. The self is not inside you. Krishna says, I am not in them. They are in me. dream body with its dream spine sitting in the dream chair. You were not in the dream. The dream is in you. Then Krishna goes on to say, well, actually, they're not even really in me. Behold my divine Maya, the support of it all. So, you were sitting in a chair in your dream? Is yes. that right? Yes. Did you wake up with a chair in bed with you? No. Where did the chair go? Vaporized. Was it real? No. Was the dream body real? No. Was the dream spine real? No. Were any of your thoughts and feelings in the dream real? Yes. No. Oh, God. Oh. None of it was real. But to the dreamer, it seemed real. Isn't that our experience? Yes, no? Yes. yes. So what the scriptures are saying right now, we are spiritually asleep. And I'm dreaming this body, mind, intellect in a dream world. And I'm dream reacting to it. So the little fellow there, the ivory dude, we call him the Buddha. What does Buddha mean? Sanskrit. The enlightened one. Awake. Awake. Yeah. He woke up from being awake. What does that mean? So you have the dream experience where I'm identified with the dream body. I awaken from that. Now I'm identified with my waker body lying in bed. But here, I'm the waker identified with my waker body, with a waker ego. And Brahma Vidya, I awaken from that dream. Now, the fourth Mahavakya that we talked about does not say, I'm a knower of Brahman. I'm a realized person. It says, Aham Brahmasmi. What does that mean? I am Brahman. Yeah. Is Brahman born? Does Brahman change? 
and Raman die. You are Jin Akasha, a regular Akasha, not space. Space of pure awareness. Unborn, unoriginated. One of the words we get is nityam. What's nityam mean? Eternal. Yes. What's the difference between nityam? And Purana or Sanatana. You're doing great. Yeah. Sanatana was also eternal, but no, no it's ancient. Ancient. Oh, Purana. Yes, Purana and Sanatana means really, really old. But Nitya means eternal. What's the difference? Time and space are ideas. The eternal is the eternal now. Let me show you what I mean by that. Think of what you did yesterday. Your experience of yesterday is an idea. What are you going to do tomorrow? It's another idea. What is, is now. You can think about this thing called the past, but that's just memory. Those are ideas. Nityam eternal is the eternal now. And time passes in front of me like a movie. Next idea. Attribute this. Yes. So this is part of our test for what the self is. The not self has attributes, form, qualities, conditions. So if it is a form, if it has qualities or characteristics, if it comes and goes, that isn't it. You have no attributes. You are like the emptiness of space, yet you shine. The light of awareness, Prakash. So if you have an experience and it has attributes, enjoy. That is not it. Any questions, any thoughts about this? Well, Jim, isn't self-realization something with attributes? There was a great 20th century saint, Meher Baba. And one of the things he used to say is everybody's already realized. 
Yeah, that's the highest knowledge. What does he mean by that? How do you know that you are you? You do not see, hear, taste, touch, smell, emote, or think yourself. Yet you do not doubt that you are. Who's doing a workshop up in Humboldt County at this place? This is going back 30 years. I ask the question, I'll frequently ask. Who here doesn't exist? Up goes a hand. <laughs> oh, you don't exist? Yes, I don't exist. He was a Buddhist. But he's a particular kind of Buddhist, what we call a Shunyavada. The scoliasts of the void. There is no ultimate reality. There's no truth. It's a misunderstanding of the Buddha's doctrine of anatta, no self. We'll go into that. But the point is, have you experienced that you don't exist? Oh, yes, I've experienced that I don't exist. Well, let's examine that. Did I have breakfast this morning? Did I? No, no. You don't know? Why don't you know? I wasn't there. You were not there. In order to know something, or listen carefully, to know the absence of something, something or someone must be there to know it. Is there a phone in my hand? Yes. yes. Is there a phone in my hand? No. You know the presence of the phone and the absence of the phone. So if you don't exist, how do you know you don't exist? Now, what the doctrine of anatman in Buddhism actually means is this jiva bhavana, this personal sense of self, definitely is not real. It's a kind of thinking. It's an event. And it comes and goes. So the samadhi of the yogis and the enlightenment of the Buddhist, it's the same. Something does go away. But you are self-evident. Now listen carefully. I can go down and start walking around the lake and I may come upon some of the people living in tents. Any of you gone around the lake and seen the people living in the tents? Yes. How are you doing? Oh, not well. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm suffering terribly. So sorry. By the way, do you exist? Of course I exist. You say you're miserable. Do you know your misery? What kind of question is that? Of course I know my misery. So the most miserable of creatures thunders, I am, I know. Listen very carefully. Spiritual ignorance never really covers the self. All you have to do is ask someone who's convinced they're in terrible ignorance, in the deepest misery. I'm so sorry. By the way, do you exist? Of course I exist. 
or they may be a scoliast of the void. Do you exist? No, 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 I don't exist. Do you know you don't exist? Yes, I know I don't exist. <laughs> Do you see the absurdity of it? So it's just this confusion in the mind. The cell is never really obscure. And here's the great cosmic joke. Everybody already has it. And the knowledge of the self is perfect. Cannot be gained, cannot be lost. That's the only real knowledge. Everybody already has it. So it's this moksha, this self-realization stuff. This way down to sounds very cheap. It's the human mind. It is the mind that suffers, not the self. How do I free the mind from its suffering? It's when the human mind has that realization. Oh, I'm not a person. I am Brahman. That experience occurs to the mind, not the cell. Technical term for it is pratya vijnana. Recognition. So, ah, that's profoundly transformative. Worldly example you're having a dream. So, Molly, when you woke up from the dream, did the alarm go off or did you just wake up? I woke up on my own. You woke up on your own. And then, did you have a thought like, oh my gosh, what a vivid dream? A little bit. Yeah. But you knew. It was a dream. Yes. That was the recognition. Oh, that was a dream. And that allowed you to let it go. You didn't get out of bed and immediately call the orthopedic surgeon. <clears throat> Did you? No. So, at the moment of realization, the sadhu goes, oh my gosh, I thought I was a person for all those years, for an eternity. Where is it gone? Where's the world gone? Blessed am I. What was that phrase that Vidyaranya used? Danyoham? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Danyoham. Less. There is a difference, though, in that example that he used. Tell me. He's able to let go and recognize that from the point of view of the waking state in relation to the dream state, which that's a lot simpler. But it would be a lot harder for him to realize and let go while he's still in the dream. We'll get to that. This is the value of samadhi. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Good question. Put it on the shelf for now. All right. Uh, next idea. We do have time. That which has neither eyes, nor ears, nor hands, nor legs. So this is the poetic way for the Rishi to say, I am not the body. Now you may be a bhakta, a devotee of the Lord. Or the gods. And you may have what we call an ishta devata, wished for deity. Oh, I'm the devotee of Lord Krishna. So in my meditation, I visualize Lord Krishna. 
Lord Shiva. Shiva. Amaji's coming to town. Devi worship. That's where it's at. It's the mother. Visualize the mother. You're all going to go to hell. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> He's God. Jesus. And he was white. <laughs> <laughs> Only one born in the Middle East was white. <laughs> Nonsense! Punisher thunders. It is not that which you worship here. It's not out there. And why are we taught to chant the Lord's names, uh, worship God? Why do we have murtis? We do puja. This is to purify the head and the heart. They're preparatory practices. This is an Upanishad. Right to the truth. In Gita, Krishna says, in whatever way people approach me, so am I to them. But it is without hands and legs and feet. We should have two arms, four arms, or a thousand arms. Any thoughts on this? Now, a murti, an, an idol, an idea of God, an image of God, an icon of God, these can be useful. So we can learn to love in a safe way. The problem with people is we tend to love in a transactional way. You love me and I'll love you. And if I don't love you in the right way, you're likely to take your love and go someplace else. Or at least I'm going to be mad at you for today. So when we have an idea of God, hopefully you do not have an anthropomorphic God in the sense where he's punishing or I always think, you know, the way in which we pray reveals our theology. Mm. Who here has prayed, oh God, please fill in the blank? Who's done that? So if I'm God, come on, Molly Beg. I love it when you pray. <laughs> no grace without begging. Come on, say please. Please, please. <laughs> Is that your God? There's no such God. No such God. The effective prayer is always the prayer of surrender. God. I surrender myself to you. Because this dethrones ego. Which ultimately is the purpose of prayer. Next idea. That is the eternal. So we've talked about that ultimate reality, which is yourself, which is Brahman, is eternal. It does not come and go or change. Next idea. Full of manifestations. Yes. So how does all this phenomenal world come about? Listen carefully. Maya is a property of Brahman. 
What is Maya? It's the word we use to describe how the impossible seems possible. How is it that consciousness, which is vijnana ganam, a homogeneous mass of sentience, one without a second, there's not consciousness plus anything, seems to have an entire cosmos appear in it. I'm not going to get it down today, but many of you have been in class when I bring up the crystal ball. So the crystal ball is stolen. Spatika. But it's a kind of stone, it's quartz crystal, which has the capacity to have images in it. Look in the crystal ball. What do you see? Oh, Jim, you're there upside down. <laughs> oh, I'm wondering if I'm going to get dizzy. Cut open the stone in. Can I find an upside down gym inside the stone? I move the stone. Oh, Jim, something else is there now. Is there anything really in the stone? It's just the nature of the crystal to have an image reflected in. It is spatika ganam, a homogeneous mass of crystal. So also, this universe is kutasta, still immovable, consciousness. Yet, Sankalpena, by means of Maya Shakti, imagination, we have many, many different words, this cosmos appears. Seen but not real, it is like the rainbow in the sky. It is like the mirage waters in the desert. It is like the castle in the clouds. It is like once upon a time there was a handsome prince who was never born. And he had no mother. Who is married. And then he jumped on the horse with wings that didn't exist and flew off to the castle in the sky and crossed over the drawbridge over the moat, which had dragons in it, in order to find the beautiful princess who didn't exist. She was sleeping on a mattress that never was. And we went to kiss her, her head disappeared. Now, did you follow the story? Mm -hmm. Was it real? No, but it appeared in the mind. Yeah, did it exist? Well, that's a very interesting question. It kind of did, and of course didn't. So Shankara says, we can't say that Maya exists. Well, we can't say it doesn't exist. All we can say is it sure is powerful. So it is by means of this imagination 
why does God imagine stuff? It's like saying, why does light travel at 186,000 miles per second instead of 187? I don't know, it just is. So the why question is unanswerable, mainly because what we're doing is attributing anthropomorphic qualities to the infinite. It's like saying, the rose bloomed this summer because he liked it. Yeah. This is what it does. But the thunderous declaration of the scriptures is this phenomenal world is not created the way a potter creates a pot. comes about by means of sun imagination. Now there's enormous repercussions to that. Probably the clearest example is last night I was watching Merlin from BBC. You even watch that series. Mm -hmm. It's fun. And all these knights got killed. And Mordred showed up. And then it was over. So you can weep with King Arthur. You can laugh with the silliness of Merlin. Here when the dragon comes. But you know, none of it. Yeah. Changes. Things. Why don't we take children to movies that are rated PG-13, like a horror movie or something like that? Images in their head, scary images. But what makes it scary? I think it's real. Yes. When we're young, we don't have the discriminative ability to discern the distinction between the real and the unreal when it comes to a movie. That's our problem. Because we do not know the immutable, unchanging, unborn self. But Brahman is the ground of the whole creation. I lose the ability to discriminate between the real. Okay, it's noon. We did one mantra. <laughs> what are we on for next week? We're still not done with this one. Oh, there's more? Yeah, there's, there's more. one more. Okay. One more idea? All pervading. Yes. So, back to Molly's dream. So, the dream body with the dream spine sitting in the dream chair. Your one mind pervaded every element. <laughs> the material cause of all the elements of the dream were your individual mind. Pervaded it. Consciousness pervades. Just like space pervades everything. I can break the cup and the space doesn't rush in. The cup is in space, but space pervades everything. Sarvamaya, Sarvam Ananda. All this is just Maya. 
what's really here. Chidana, bliss, and consciousness. Is that the last one? Uh, one more. Subtlest of the subtle. Okay. Same idea. So we'll quit here and take up the next month. Actually, there's one more idea. That perishable being is what the wise perceive as the source of creation. Yes. That's the source of it all. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Yonamaha Hari Om